mentioned this one back here this is maya she also loves looking out the window at birds and i bring up maya because we're gonna start today like we start every day uh you guys we have a bingo board shouts to grace again for making our bingo board here it is friends family this is our dino 101 bingo for today thursday april whatever it is i don't even know uh remember if you get five across horizontally vertically diagonally send a message to grace uh christina is teaching today so she's not here grace is gonna get the messages from you guys if and when you get a bingo, as well as any questions you have throughout our time for me or ideally for Kaylee, who we should introduce in a hot second. But first, Grace, what do we always do right after the bingo? What do I show? Uh, dino of the day. Thank you, you're gone for two days, but you didn't forget how this works. This is it, ladies and gentlemen, arguably the first verb. Archaeopteryx. We've talked about Archaeopteryx before in a number of like little bits here and there, but as the arguably the first verb, I thought it deserved its own day as the dino of the day. There's also some nice um, segues into what we're going to talk about today. So this is it. This is Archaeopteryx. This is your dino of the day. For size, I didn't put a scale picture. About the size of a modern pigeon or crow or raven, somewhere in that, that size. So not big, not like, not like yesterday. <laughs> or the titanosaur. So this is it, this is our dino of the day, Archaeopteryx. But more importantly, we have an incredibly, I'm excited about our special guest today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you may know her from Science Twitter. That's how I came into contact with her. Kaylee, you're one of my absolute favorite people on Science Twitter. You're a lecturer at the University of Washington and you study crow death behavior. Kaylee, first of all, where are you zooming in from? Where, where are you right now? I am zooming in from my house in Yakima, which is a um, town in Eastern Washington. So okay. a rural community on the dry side of the mountains here in Washington state. How far from Seattle is that? It's about two hours and 20 minutes. Okay, so do you have to drive? Yeah, to so it made that, made my, what? I was gonna say it made uh, lecturing at the UW when we still had in, in school classes. Uh, an adventure because I would commute over to um, Seattle at the beginning of the week and then stay with family and or friends and then commute back at the end of the week. So it's sort of a fun foray as a you know married uh, mid 30s person of living with my parents a lot. <laughs> a lot of us are <laughs> and, and sitting on a tour wheel and it was sort of a fun flashback. <laughs> and now we're like stuck in that. A lot of us are, which is yeah. <laughs> so you're not doing a five hour commute a day. That's good. No. No. no, no. All right, we're going to talk about what you do at the University of Washington and your studying of cre uh, crow death behaviors in a minute, but I thought we'd jump right into it. I know you're excited. I'm excited. Everyone is excited to play everyone's favorite game, dino or not a dino. <laughs> Very technically, you study dinosaurs. You study living avian extant dinosaurs, so I'm, I'm expecting a 10 out of 10 from you today. You I should. I have a feeling I'm going to be great at this game okay all right everyone should have their expectations like up here high expectations but for this game there's a very low bar there's 10 animals i'm going to read, read the name of 10 different animals some of which are real dinosaurs some are not you can ask for a spelling should you need it right okay. all you have to do is get six out of ten to win okay <laughs> six out of ten so again i'm going to read you the name of a dino if you need a spelling, you can ask. I would recommend looking around the Zoom chat. We have a lot of very smart dino scientists here that might give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Ignore whatever Stefan says to you. Other than that, are you ready to play? I'm ready. All right, Kaylee, let's dive in, dig in. Dive in, we're gonna dig in because it's fossils. That's the joke in my head. Number one, Grovenator. Grovenator. I can in spell a sentence. this. You, what? <laughs> I said, can you use it in a sentence? Sure. Uh, your first animal for dino or not a dino is Grovenator. Oh, well, in that case, I think the Grovenator is not a real dinosaur. You are correct. You are one for one. Well done. Good job. All right. Let's see. I'm going to write these down, make sure I don't mess up the score. All right. So you're one for one. I should also mention there is a theme for the non-dino dinos. So you get bonus points if you can kind of figure out what that is. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Okay, I okay. already have one idea. You're one for one. Number two, 
Anchiornis. Anchiornis. I'm going to go yes. Any reasoning behind that? It just sounds like what I would call a dinosaur. It's got, you know, those chuz and horns and chuz and yep. sounds like dinosaur. Okay, yeah. so your intuition is correct. You are now two for two. Anchiornis is a dinosaur. Next, Bertonicus. Bertonicus. No. Wow, you are confident in your answers, and they're all right thus far. Three for three, Bertonicus. <laughs> well done. All right, these may get a little bit more difficult. Codipteryx. Codipteryx. Okay. I'm going to... Ooh. Yeah, let's look around the room. Look around the room. I'm looking around the room. It is not, not consistent oh. with no. what I think is the theme. Okay. So I'm going to go yes. You're going yes. I'm going yes. It's real. Well, you are off to a great start. And you are still off to a great start. Four for four. Wow. Woo! Wow. <laughs> four for four. Yeah, this is, Grace, have you wow. ever seen anything like this? Never. This Never. is so impressive. I mean, we have a lot of smart, confident people on the show, but wow. Yeah. I think this there's is... been, uh, we've had one person get 10 out of 10, and it's actually our friend Natty, who is a, a kid. So you are competing yeah. for supremacy <laughs> against Natty, which is a high bar. Number five. Let me make sure I pronounce this right. Protosker. Protosker. I know. Mm -mm. Wow, you're, oh, you're right, five for five. Maybe I need to make these more difficult. This is, you're crushing the game right now. All right, <laughs> number six, Pedopena. Pedopena. P-E-D-O-P-E-N-N-A. Pedopena. Pedopena. It sounds, that sounds better because those roots are all things that I'm familiar with. What are the, can you explain? What do you mean? Uh, like, like, uh, pedo, like feet or mm -hmm. foot. Mm -hmm. And then penna usually relates to, I'm trying to think, like, I've heard of it in penacious, mm -hmm. but I actually don't know what the root means. I just know that it's a root in a lot of science words. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go yes. Or this was a very clever one. And do you, you want me right. to tell you what that penna means? And then you can make a guess. So you're right. Pen yeah. means what penna refers to feathers. Okay, that's what I, yeah, that's what I figured. Okay. Yeah, so that makes sense, because I know dinosaurs, you know, the avian dinosaurs had feathers going all the way down their legs onto their, oh, I so you're saying their an animal, I guess I don't know that one. So you're saying an animal whose name means foot feather, you think is an actual real dino? Yeah, that had feathers on its feet. Dr. Kaylee Swift, six for wow. six. Wow, wow, six wow. for six, this is very impressive. All right, oh we're in the <laughs> so proud of myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're in the home stretch. Next, micro raptor. Micro raptor. Uh, see Jenna Hartley has a couple thumbs up with a kiddo. Daniel Rizzo's got his thumb up. Maybe he's heard of micro raptor. Gary, who has a dinosaur on his shoulder currently, <laughs> is saying thumbs up. Okay, I have to go thumbs up. And again, it makes sense. Like that seems like a, you know, a sciencey name and it is inconsistent with what I suspect the theme of your uh, Oh, I like it. I like your, your cross analyzing. Okay, uh, Microraptor is a real dino. That's a real dino. If you guess that it was a species of raptor that is small, you were correct. Yeah, that I could have <laughs> broken down easily. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty easy. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. Elmodon. No. <laughs> you don't even want a spelling. You just know. No. Just know. No. So she's so sure, so confident. All right, all right. You're right. Elmodon is not a dinosaur. You are wow. Eight for eight. Two more to take home. Undefeated. All right, here we go. Number nine. I'm so anxious right now. I like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I love the energy and enthusiasm that you're bringing and the strategy you're bringing to Dino or not a Dino. I think your strategy is only rivaled by that of Vanessa Hill, who's a brain expert and psychologist who like was trying to break down my rationale for making these, which I feel like you've already figured out. Number nine, Sonornithosaurus. Sonornithosaurus. 
I don't know why that's funny to Grace, but it is. Sonornithosaurus. It's, you know what? I don't know why uh, it's funny either. That's really throwing me off. Sonornithosaurus. Do you like a spelling? Do you want a spelling? Yeah, I want a spelling. Okay. S I N O R N I T H O Saurus. Sin nor nithosaurus. S I N O R N I T H O Saurus. You know, that spelling helped because I'm going to go yes based on the spelling. What, why? What do you mean it helped? Because it has a lot of unnecessary vowels and consonants, <laughs> which seems to be a theme among dinosaur names, as I cannot pronounce most of them correctly. Okay. <laughs> and so your final answer is what is your final answer? Yes, yeah. Now. Okay, so that yes. was number nine. Yes. You had gotten eight right, and now you've gotten nine correct. You are nine for nothing. <laughs> this is very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, before I give you the last one to see if you can get a perfect score, have you figured out the theme of the not dinos? Yes. I can read these back if you want. No, I've, I, I knew the theme on the first one. D oh, okay. W what was it? Can you, do you share, care to share? Sesame Street. So we have Grovenator as in Grover. We have Bert, Bertonicus. We got uh, Proto Oscar, so Protosker, Oscar the Grouch, Elmodon, Elmo, obviously. This last one is tricky though. So if you can get this, you have achieved something only one other person, Natty, who's in the room with us right now, has achieved. Last but not least, to get a perfect score, dino or not a dino, Snuffleupagus Rex. <laughs> I am going with... Take your time. Dino. You know, it's a tough. That's not a dino, not a dino. You're, you're correct. You, first of all, you got 10 out of 10, which is amazing. <laughs> Perfect score. You nailed right from the get-go the theme. I'm realizing I need to make these a little bit more difficult. Uh, or you're just the smartest person I've ever had here. You know, I don't want to contradict that. But yeah, something about... Um, I was like, Grover. Because there's only, Grover is such an uncommon word. I was like... There's only one context I've ever heard that name. That's and interesting because like I put that first because I was like, well, Grove is like an area or a type of environment maybe and that could have been used to make the name. So in my, but Grace is saying, no, you're an idiot. You no, should have put that. No, Kaylee, I'm right there with you. That first one I was like, oh, of course. All right. All right. Well, you know, nobody's perfect. Um, but all right. I so appreciate it because I expected to bomb this <laughs> exam because I'm not a good test taker. And you have just made my day by making me feel absolutely freaking awesome. So I like loved this. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that you won as well because we didn't tell you that if you don't win, if you don't get six, we just immediately boot you out of the Zoom room and we're done. Oh, so yeah. you get to stay. You which take is my awesome. degree away and yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they kick you off your teaching position. Uh, speaking of your teaching position, so Kayla, can you tell us what exactly it is that you study and what is it that you teach about? And also I'm curious, are they the same thing? Ah, okay. <clears throat> so right off the bat, no. Okay. Uh, well, kind of. <laughs> Already doing a super good and clear job. Okay, so what I study is uh, on a very broad scale, I study avian ecology, behavior, cognition. I kind of dabble in all of those things. Uh, on a real specific fine scale, my specialty is uh, or was as a graduate student, understanding, as you said, the funeral behaviors of crows. So I, so crows are among a small group, as far as we know, so far anyway, of animals that seem to have a, a pretty extreme response when one of them dies. They, they really take notice. Like a lot of animals, you know, if you see a squirrel that got uh, hit by a car, other squirrels are kind of walking by it and they're like, blah, 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 blah. they're kind of going on. And then some other animals might be like, mm, I don't want to like be near that, but whatever. But crows are more like primates or elephants or the cetaceans, so things like dolphins that are like, what is this? this so, something's happening. I'm going to do something pretty conspicuous in response to this dead body. So I spent six years trying to understand uh, what might be motivating their responses. And obviously there are a lot of different ways that we could explain that. And not all of those explanations are testable. So for example, maybe this bird in this photo is like really upset. It's really sad that it's discovered that this bird is dead. 
asking whether or not this crow is experiencing that kind of um, emotion is not something that I can scientifically test. So it's not something that I can confirm or deny. Totally, maybe it is. But one thing that I could more specifically test is whether or not they were using these moments as ways to learn about danger in their environment and make sure that they wouldn't succumb to the same kind of you know, threat that, that killed this crow. And uh, through, over the course of a couple of different experiments, <clears throat> we were able to, to provide pretty good evidence that that's the case, that crows use dead crows as cues of risk, and then they modify their behavior in an environment where they learn new predators based on seeing uh, people, specifically what we were looking at. If they see you holding a dead crow, they will learn you and they will assume that you are threatening because you were interacting with that dead crow. And then we did a, a couple other experiments just looking with a little bit more nuance, like if crows pay attention to things like age, because one thing that we've seen in a lot of different animals, uh, like elephants and primates, is they don't do one thing. They do a lot of different things. And we don't really know why, but one possible explanation is, well, maybe they do different things depending on things like how the animal died or uh, how old it was when it died, all that kind of stuff. And then the last thing we looked at was um, their brains. So we did a non-lethal, uh, non-invasive, meaning non-surgical uh, pet imaging study where we were able to look at their brain activity um, after, well, while they had seen a dead crow. So that's kind of what I studied in a nutshell. But as far as what I teach, I wish I could just like teach a whole class on crows all the time. I would love that. But I teach more general um, ornithology, wildlife ecology, and conservation. Cool. Um, I'm just curious to know, is this generally the outfit you wear with your students? Or speaking of danger in your environment, can you, what, what's the deal here? Uh, I think <laughs> okay. It doesn't like <clears throat> So in our first experiment, like I said, we were interested in trying to figure out if crows use dead crows as cues of danger. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask is, could crows be learning new predators based on their interactions with dead crows? And so the predator we picked to test this question on was people. Now, for a variety of reasons, it, I couldn't send a real, like an unmasked, obviously this is somebody in a mask. This actually isn't me, it was one of my colleagues at the time. Um, I couldn't send an unmasked person out, mostly because I, I didn't have access to people who were gonna be available with the consistency that I would need because the way that we tested this question was we would start feeding crows for three days uh, then we would have our, our funeral day where we would send somebody out holding the dead crow. And then that person needed to come back once a week for up to six weeks. And I didn't necessarily have people who were like, yeah, I can definitely commit to being part of this project for up to six weeks and I'm always gonna be available on this day. So the way that we could get around that issue is by having people just wear masks because that way it didn't matter who was under it. To the crows, it was always the same person because we know based on previous studies that the thing crows cue in on as they learn us is mostly our face. With time, they might learn other elements, but to start with, it's the face. So if we could artificially keep that consistent across a, a whole variety of people, then we could ask this question. Cool. So speaking of a variety of people, there are a variety of corvids, right? So cor crows, as far as I know, are part of um, the corvidae family. And so I'm just curious, because I was looking into this last night, because I assume like, oh, maybe crows, ravens, magpies, but there's a whole suite of different birds under corvidae, right? Outside of just crows and ravens. Do you, do you work with any of those? And, and can you give people just like a hint of what some of those different ones are? Like I learned last night, blue jays are in that same family. Yeah, so in North America are, uh, and is your audience uh, global or mostly? We are from all over the world. Terrific. In fact, so, I know there's a question from a zookeeper in Melbourne, Australia that we're going to get to, but go ahead. Nice. So uh, in North America, our corvids includes, like you said, the crows, ravens, magpies, but it also includes all the jays. Uh, the one other corvid I've been able to work with besides crows are Canada jays, and some people might know them uh, as the gray jay, because that was their name up until I think 20, 2019, 2018 is when they had that name change. But in uh, other parts of the world, like in Europe, 
you have things like jackdaws and rooks. Uh, in across many parts of Asia, you'll have birds like uh, tree peas. Those are also corvids. And then um, chuffs are another less known. There's not very many. I, I, there's only, let's see, I think there's only one chuff that's a corvid, which is the alpine chuff. There's an Australian chuff called the white wing chuff, but that's actually very confusingly not a corvid. And since we were talking about Australia, just so folks know, the Australian magpie, also not a corvid. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It gets so, confusing. I have one more question specifically about birds alive today that I'm really interested to hear kind of your thoughts or uh, like your knowledge about the evolution of feathers in general. So you mentioned that great apes and some like dolphins, orcas, um, are able to recognize their own dead, right? And can obviously, maybe not mourn, but recognize like something has happened to this thing. Mm -hmm. And so my mind then immediately went to, well, people may have heard of the mirror test where people put specific animals in front of a mirror. It's one gauge that may or may, may, or may not determine if they're self-aware, right? And those same exact animals are the ones that have passed the mirror test. Orcas, dolphins, the great apes, humans, and Eurasian magpies. So I'm curious, like, do you have thoughts on the mirror test? Have you ever done or know anyone that's done mirror tests with crows or ravens outside of the Eurasian magpie? I do. I have lots of thoughts on the mirror okay, test. Okay, please. <laughs> so, so we, people like to say that Eurasian magpies pass the mirror test. We like to, we like to say that. We like to say. People like you, Dustin. Uh, but... So it is, it's true that in the experiment that was conducted, two magpies successfully passed. And the way they tested that is they applied these stickers essentially to, I think it was like the breast feathers, and they put them in front of a mirror. And for some of them, they had colored stickers. And for a control group, they had stickers that blended in. And what they wanted to see is would the birds look in a mirror and be like, oh, crumb, and then like get it off. Yeah. And they found that two of them could do that. The trouble is, we have since repeated that study in some other birds like jackdaws. And they did the exact same thing and they found that in that case, they were equally as good at removing the stickers regardless of the color. Uh, so that seemed to suggest that they maybe weren't so much using the mirror to assess, but it was actually the feeling of it. Okay. So it, it's a little less uh, clear now if, we really should be saying that um, these Eurasian magpies passed. The other thing is other corvids, including uh, American crows, ravens, that we have done these tests with, uh, fail consistently. <laughs> uh, and in fact, some people might have even had the exper experience in the summertime of crows coming and tapping on your windows or like your car mirrors. And the reason for that is because they're failing the mirror test and they're perceiving their own reflections as competitors. And that's really common in birds, like robins will do that too. So if a bird is ever during the summertime like tapping on your windows, uh, and they can really hurt themselves doing this, uh, just uh, put some paper up to block out the reflection. It's a good solution to that. Sorry. But, but <laughs> the really interesting thing is, so New Caledonian crows are, one of the smartest species, meaning that they just are capable of a, of a really wide suite of really cognitively complex behaviors like causal reasoning. Mm -hmm. And they, here's the thing, so they fail the mirror test, but they understand how mirrors work. So what I mean by that is the thing that we look for when you put an animal in front of a mirror is um, self-directed behaviors. Right? Like when we get in front of a mirror, you like pick your nose and you check your teeth and you like check your hair and those are self-directed behaviors. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for. And we see that in dolphins. They, you know, they look at their teeth and then they look at the other body part that a lot of animals are really interested in when they get in front of a mirror. Uh, and we don't see that with New Caledonian crows. But if you create a situation where they're looking in a mirror and you've hid food behind them, they know that it's behind them they don't go looking on the other side of the mirror. So they understand the, the properties of how a mirror works, but they don't seem to show self-directed behaviors. And so what that suggests is maybe the mirror test just is not a reasonable way or an appropriate way to ask that question of self-recognition for all animals. Yeah. We talked a lot about this when we talked to Vanessa Hill, this uh, brain and psychology expert, about how there are different types of tests for intelligence across different species. And it's really hard 
with our brains think about, well, how would we test our intelligence? How do we translate that to a different animal? Is this one way? Is it really telling us how smart it is? Are we really testing what we think we're testing? And so the thing I have learned is really that there are all these different tests for intelligence, like brain to body size ratio, encephalization quotient, the mirror test. And I think the best thing to do is look at as many as possible. And then even then you still have to kind of take what you think with a grain of salt because measuring intelligence, even defining intelligence is not easy. Yeah. 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 All right. So we talked a lot about modern dinosaurs, Corvidae. So I know that you've studied, know a lot about feathers. Uh, so can we transition to talking about some, some dinosaurs that lived a very long time ago, specifically your favorite, the dino of the day is Archaeopteryx. Am I correct? That yes. Is, you told me last night that is your fave. So mm -hmm. when you teach and you talk about feathers, I guess, can you give us like a two to three minute crash course in what you know or what you teach when it comes to feathers and feather evolution? Well, the first thing I teach that uh, really surprises most, so I teach uh, at two levels. I have a 100 level class that's mostly freshmen, sophomores, and then I teach an upper level 400 class, and that's gonna be mostly juniors. Mm -hmm. And what I find across both of those spectrums is most people still don't know that birds are modern dinosaurs. So when we talk about dinosaurs having feathers, their, their minds are blown. They're just like, what? What? Why doesn't it look like that? When, then when I see it in like popular culture, and I'm like, I know. I You're also doing God's know. work, Kaylee. You're doing God's work right now. <laughs> um, but so we just kind of talk about how, you know, right, it's, it's hard to imagine seeing a, you know, a flighted bird, even an unflighted bird, a version of feathers that wouldn't have been used for that purpose, right? Because it's hard to imagine like, well, how do you, what's like the middle ground of that look like? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we talk about the perfect, yeah, basically <laughs> that there's, there's evidence that starting about, you know, what is it, 240, 50 million years ago, we had these first sort of wire-like feathers. And from there, we see it start to split into these different barbules that with enough time uh, emerged into the, you know, venaceous feathers that we have today. Um, but the fact that they didn't, you know, they clearly weren't very useful for flight. No. And even when they became closer to the feathers that we know today, the other morphology of the dinosaurs that exhibited these feathers would not, still have not been very useful for flight. Their right. arms were too short, their bodies were too heavy. Um, and so then that brings this really interesting question, because for most people, feathers is is flight like what is the point of feather if it's not for flight and so this brings a really good opportunity to talk about all of the other things that an animal could use feathers for that have nothing to do with gliding and eventually flying like what like so oh my gosh i wish we could like play videos so one okay. is that Feathers are beautiful, and you don't have to be a human being to appreciate that. You can just be another animal of that species to be like, I like your style. Hence the peacock. It's called yes. peacocking for a reason. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So feathers might have been a really valuable way to just show off your quality as a mate. Mm -hmm. uh, feathers are also really good, and especially if you have them on these nice big wings, uh, are really good at providing shade. And I, we have, I believe, found evidence, like fossil records of a dinosaur, I can't remember what kind it is now, so hopefully you know, Dustin, uh, preserve literally in this position over its nest. Yeah, there have is been multiple, yeah. no, we found multiple dinosaurs now, mostly in the oviraptor family that show, like, that have died and were fossilized while brooding over a clutch of eggs. Yeah, in that yeah. exact position. Yep. So yeah. feathers really good for providing shade, maybe even camouflage, they could have been like, hunkering down, like, I'm just a mound, I don't know. Um, so, you know, uh, sexual selection and showing off, providing shade, uh, insulation too. Mm -hmm. You know, feathers are really, there's a reason that birds live in the coldest parts of the world, where most other animals, we don't find them, right? <laughs> so feathers can be amazingly insulative. Um, so there's lots of reasons why uh, we saw this evolution of this feature that then eventually was co-opted into this really handy thing of flight, but probably didn't start that way. No, definitely not. Um, in fact, probably started something like this. You shared with me this picture, so I'm going to share with everyone. Kaylee, what's the deal with this? I think this is like 100, 100, somewhere in the 100 to 150 million year old amber fossil. 
Yeah, and so this is a dino tail, and it's the first, this was the first tail that they ever found that had uh, these intact feathers attached to it, uh, which again is just a, another really cool indication of uh, where on you know their bodies dinosaurs were exhibiting feathers and and how they might have been using them. And we look, we it looks like it's the predecessor to our current ants too that's trapped in that amber right there. Yeah, right? I know. Whoever found this was was must have just been psyched. <laughs> so, <laughs> so much. <laughs> I know, Grace. I know we're gonna have a lot of questions for Kaylee. I just wanted to show one more slide from my shared here. Uh, again, so this is this is your op Archaeopteryx. This is the famous fossil. Again, Archaeopteryx. In German, where it was, oh, it was found in Germany, uh, its name is Urhugel, which means literally translates to first bird or first wing. And we're pretty sure either uh, Archaeopteryx or some other dinos like Anchiornis, I mentioned earlier. Oh, by the way, the theme for the actual dinos, I forgot to say in Dino or Not a Dino, those are all dinosaurs we now know absolutely had feathers. So Anchiornis, Caudipteryx, Pedopena, Mycoraptor, Sonornithosaurus, these are all dinos with direct evidence of feathers, much like the Archaeopteryx you're looking at right now, or our depiction right here. I love like the blues and the greens here. Most of the colors are speculative. We now know for some small feathered dinosaurs what color those feathers actually were, because we can look at melanosomes, which are microscopic uh, structures, and the shape and orientation of those corresponds with specific colors in modern birds. So when we find those same microscopic structures in an extinct dinosaur, we can start to glean clues about its coloration. And recently we learned that Archaeopteryx, as beautiful as it looks right here, actually looked a lot more like this. It was almost entirely black with some a little bits of white here and there. Um, but I wanna go back real quick because you mentioned all these features in feathers and in birds and in dinosaurs. And so when it comes to Archaeopteryx, the big question is, we, we call it first bird, and that is because we really don't know if we should call it a dinosaur or specifically a bird, because it has that mix of features that is like right at that splitting point between things you would definitely call just a dinosaur, not a bird, or something you would definitely call a bird. Either way, so we're not really sure, but either way, I had to share this with you. Uh, shouts to M for making this. Regardless, Archaeopteryx is definitely most likely to succeed Again, his first bird, and as we all know, birds, avian, ex extant living dinosaurs, the only ones that survived the mass extinction that killed all of their cousins. Uh, also, I love the yearbook quote here. Um, just, just, ah! <laughs> all right, um, let's transition. Oh, and also, Kaylee, I just wanted to show you this because any excuse to show people this picture, why not? Uh, this is a picture you're about to see of a baby T-Rex with feathers. Yeah. yeah, crowd pleaser. Look at those little teeth. I love the little teeth. Those are just great. All right, Grace, let's do some questions. I know our squad has got a lot. The Dino Corn team is very smart, very curious. Grace, hit us. Uh, we do. So um, Kaylee, from Kelly and from Catherine, are there any books about crows for adults Ooh. or that you would recommend or any video YouTube recommendations that you have for learning more about this? First, just follow her on Twitter and then go ahead, Kaylee. <laughs> yes, uh, so you can follow me on Twitter. You can also, for that kind of stuff, um, I have a blog that I've been maintaining for uh, like six years. I started at my first year of graduate school, corvidresearch.blog. I actually have a whole article of my book recommendations. Uh, but the short version is In the Company of Crows and Ravens by John Marsliff is a great like intro into this. this I, I tell people, consider this kind of your reference handbook. It's easy to read, it's comprehensive, and it's a good first little taste into it. Um, Mind of the Raven by Bernd Heinrich. Uh, he's an, another amazing naturalist writer. If your thing is more ravens, uh, that's a terrific one. Uh, but there are a variety of other authors and books. So check out um, Best Books for Corvid Lovers. If you Google that, my article should come up. And there are lots of options there for a variety of age ranges. Great. Um, so speaking of ravens, Natty wants to know, could you explain the difference between a raven and a crow? Yes, I can. So uh, there are uh, a couple of things that you can look at. So first off, uh, crows and ravens are different species in the same genus. So that's the same relationship as like lions and tigers. 
In terms of actually being able to identify them, you see a bird flying around and you're like, is that a crow or a raven? <clears throat> Size is uh, a good thing to, to know just because, so ravens are about twice the size of a crow. So if you're not, you know, if you have them both in the same area, that can be really useful. But even if you haven't, I find that people who are used to seeing crows, the first time they see a raven, you're like, dang, that thing is huge. <laughs> like it feels aggressively large. And so even if you're not like quite perceiving, like you're like, oh, it's big, therefore it's a raven, you'll kind of get the sense of like, geez, Louise. Uh, so, so bear that in mind. Uh, ravens also have these very distinctive feathers on their throats called um, hackles. So oh, I don't know that I included a good picture of that. No uh, pictures. But, uh, but then in flight, this is what this is showing. The, the best uh, feature to look at when they're flying is the tail shape. So ravens have that wedge shape and crows have a more kind of rounded or square shape. But if you um, go up, Dustin, I, I did include a picture, yeah, above the crow in the uh, scanner. Yeah, so that's the comparison of ravens and crows. So it's, it is okay. fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's way bigger. Okay, cool. Uh, great. So a very interesting question here from Karasaurus. I think I said that right. Um, so they want to know all the animals you listed that demonstrate funeral behaviors are believed to be of higher cognitive ability and development. So could funeral behaviors be considered an indicator and or requirement of evolutionary advancement like a mirror test? Is the ability to recognize and have an emotional response to death dependent on cognitive development? Wow. Hmm. So that is a, a good and complex question. Yeah. So first thing I will say, it's probably gonna take some people off. Uh, <laughs> I would say that we are not yet at a place to know for sure if they're having the kind of emotional reaction that we are. Because like Dustin talked about, um, it's so incredibly difficult to interpret animal behaviors without sort of applying our own you know, human lens. Which again, is not to say that they couldn't be. We just don't know yet. Um, as far as saying, should is that a goalpost? Some kind of litmus test we should use? I would. I would hesitate to agree to that, mostly because, you know, we just haven't really explored this in most animals. Like some animals clearly do really conspicuous things that catch our attention and then we go, oh yeah, if that orca was carrying its calf around for 17 days, we're, you know, we noticed that and that seems significant. Orcas must do something around their dead. But there could be a whole variety of other animals that do something and maybe it's just more subtle than that. And then, and so we haven't really taken notice. So I, I feel like until we start to look at this more comprehensively, we shouldn't necessarily put these other animals in too, you know, in too much of a like really special place. Now, I believe that. However, do I think that animals like elephants and dolphins and crows do probably do do something a little bit more significant? Yes. I think that if we were to explore that, we would find that trend. We just haven't explored that yet, so I kind of want to maintain a little bit of um, uh, skepticism and open-mindedness in terms of how unique that really is. Great. So we have a few people asking similar questions, which I'm going to sort of consolidate. Um, Basically, why do you think or why have you seen other people think um, that crows and ravens get such a bad rep? Um, they're often associated with death, darkness, witchcraft, um, and has this view changed since olden times or not? I, that was my question too, my last question. <laughs> Go ahead. Great question. So the first thing I want to say is just to remind people that that uh, attitude towards crows is a fairly Eurocentric one. So corvids exist basically in every country and every continent and every country around the world. And different cultures may have really different perspectives on these birds. But yes, in Western culture, we have had hundreds and hundreds of years of being creeped out by crows and ravens. So why is that? Well, uh, it's because their association with death is not, a, um, is not an unreasonable one. Uh, so, you know, these birds are um, scavengers, particularly carrion crows and ravens in Europe, uh, would have been more than happy to feast on dead human bodies. And during really significant periods of death uh, in human history, 
like uh, during the Crusades and then later during the plague, we would have seen crows eating bodies. And in Western culture, that is not the way we like to see our dead treated. It's not true all around the world. So that's how some people want to go out. But for Western people, like that is a really disrespectful thing. And so we don't like that. Um, so especially during the plague where you just had, you know, mass amounts of bodies out in the open, people would have seen that. And plague doctors, because the smell was so overwhelming, would wear these big bird masks so that they could stuff them with aromatic, you know, herbs and flowers and stuff uh, that sort of added to this, you would see these like walking ravens, basically, there were people uh, rummaging around these dead bodies. And so that combination of things just sort of cemented this as, as being very negative. But it is interesting because before that period, even though crows were still associated with death, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. People really appreciated these birds as sort of offering this heads up that your time might be nigh and it would give you an opportunity to make peace with God or you know, get your affairs in order. So, so crows have in Western cultures for a long time been associated with death, but it really wasn't until that, that plague era that that turned a corner of being a really negative thing. All right, I think we have time for one more question before we go to our, I forgot to mention this, Kaylee. I think I told you last night, actually, at the end, we go through our paleo art gallery of all these beautiful Archaeopteryx renderings. So I will spotlight everyone's pictures, and then you and I can comment. They're all going to be 10 out of 10, just like your score. But we'll get that in a sec. I actually want to unmute my friend, Catherine Levinson, who, correct me if I'm wrong, Catherine, but you uh, work at the Melbourne Zoo which is in Melbourne, Australia, and it is in the middle of the night there. So hit us with your question, because you asked me on Twitter, I was like, I've never seen this, this is fascinating. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we um, got shown is the Jap Japanese ravens um, dropping nuts on, onto a road in which they get cracked. And then um, they've gone, I don't know if you'll see it, David Attenborough, commentates it and um, they've learned that um, if they throw it on the pedestrian crossing strip that the, um, once the cars stop to let pe people cross that the ravens can then go go out r retrieve their nuts without being hit, hit by a car um, yeah yeah so and, like it is that do you think that they've learned that is it just so it happens to be that you know someone was in the right place at the right time um, and what is the pot potential um, what can we learn from from that like can we assume that other birds perhaps have got that same sort of yeah abilities so uh, the the video she's describing depicts uh, carrion crows which are native in Japan Japan also has another species called the um, uh, large billed crow uh, but what uh, so this, this actually, I love this. Okay. So basically in the 1970s, there was a driving school and it might still exist today. There's a driving school in Japan. I think it was called the Kidan driving school. I'm trying to remember the name. And they were seeing this where uh, the carrion crows would drop, I don't know what kind of nut it was, but they would drop nuts in the roadway and they would like wait for the cars to come and, and run them over. And then they would go and retrieve them, which is, interesting and significant but what was really cool was over the next two decades they saw that behavior expand out away from the driving school so what that told us is that some bird had sort of hit on this system and through social learning other birds had picked that up as a as a useful tactic and that knowledge has slowly spread away from the school i haven't really heard any accounts from it since the 90s. So I don't know if that's still something that they're tracking or really seeing much today. Uh, you know, dropping nuts on, on hard surfaces to crack them open is not all that unusual. So we, of course, see that in crows. We see that in some other birds too. But the timing it the way that they did, that was really significant and does suggest a certain level of insight that we don't see among, you know, goals, for example, that just kind of fly and drop their nuts. And they don't really seem to um, be very uh, strategic in terms of whether or not they're dropping it onto like a hard surface versus a soft surface. And we actually have since tested that question on New Caledonian crows and found that they, they do know which, which is the right thing. 
Um, so yeah, I could go on and on about this, but I, I want to get to those really great drawings. So I, I will stop there. <laughs> it's fast. It's fascinating study. It's, I had not seen that Catherine. So thank you for pointing that out to me. It's such a cool learned behavior. Um, so Grace, I understand that we have a bingo. So as you are finding out, or you're going to tell me about that in a second, there's a couple of questions from the chat. I just wanted to answer, um, hopefully pretty briefly. So first of all, uh, Rob asked, did Archaeopteryx eat eggs? Maybe. Maybe. I'd, I've not heard of any evidence for or against that. We haven't found them in association with eggs the way we have like Cytopodi or some other oviraptorids. So we're not really sure. Beck asks, why can a pteranodon fly without feathers? Feathers are one amazing way nature has figured out how to fly. But the first things that were able to achieve powered flight on this planet, the pterosaurs didn't have feathers. Bats don't have feathers either. So there are other ways that you can glide and take to the sky other than feathers. Um, let's see, was that the last one? Yeah. So Grace, who got bingo and uh, what do they want from me? <laughs> so Tyrannosaurus, or I'm saying this wrong, but um, they would like a story from m &H, something in the Hall of Asian Mammals. Okay. I, I told my mom to get ready. So uh, Grace, can you tell Kaylee what the bingo winner gets, the option of asking? So sure. So Kaylee, the bingo winner, um, they either get to ask Dustin's mom, Sharon, who is somewhere here. Are you still here? Hi, mom. Hi, Hi mom. mom. They either get to ask Sharon uh, something about Dustin, or they can name a hall in the American Museum of Natural History, and Dustin will tell a fun fact, brief story about the museum. Okay. Yeah. So uh, do they want to know something about me from my mom, or they want to know about the museum? They want to know about the Hall of Asian Mammals. Okay, uh, Hall of Asian Mammals at the American, my mom's like, good, I don't wanna talk about you today. Uh, the Hall of Asian Mammals, that's a pretty underrated hall. It's a pretty old hall. There's still some of the uh, like old school taxidermy where it's like an animal in a glass case rather than in a, like an environment with the whole background painting. I think one of my favorite things about that hall is if you enter not like from the main rotunda but from the other side through uh, the Hall of Asian Peoples, it appears as though because there are two elephants side by side facing opposite directions, it looks like from a distance, it is a two-headed elephant with heads on either side of its body pointing opposite directions. So that's pretty fun. Also, uh, you can notice that those Asian elephant ears are smaller than the African elephant ears. That's one easy way to tell an African elephant apart from the Asian elephant. I'm not sure if this is exactly the right reason, but I've heard that a big part of that is generally speaking, African elephants live in hotter climates and the bigger ears are a way to dissipate heat in a way that isn't quite as necessary for the Asian elephants. So that is my anecdote from the Hall of Asian Mammals at the American Museum of Natural History. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, let's do this Paleo Art Gallery. So friends, please hold up your amazing renderings of Archaeopteryx. We're gonna take a quick walk around the room. Um, just Kaylee, if you wanna chime in, feel free. We have some tremendous artists. I'm gonna say that off the jump. Here we go. Oh. Kaylee, yeah, so this, this uh, brings up a great point, the name of this, of this dinosaur. So people have been asking me throughout this entire episode, what do you think of the crows have eyes, three, the crowing? <laughs> <laughs> big fan. I am a big fan of the crows have <laughs> eyes. Yeah, I, yep. I, what yeah. Is, um, Moira's performance as a crow convincing? Yes, absolutely. I think she really captured the, the kindness of it, you know, and just like, ah! <laughs> yeah, people have been, you know, dying to ask that. Yes. Okay. Seal of approval. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. Right? I love that. So, so wait, good. did people literally do this in this space right yeah, now? that's the thing. We give people like 45 minutes and they come up with these beautiful drawings. I'm never not impressed. Never not impressed. There's so much detail. I know. I, don't... I know. Oh. Shadow and peep. That's. I love the names. I know. Yep. Oh, how about these guys? Look at oh. these. Those look so good. Oh, man. I like the little T-Rex on the desk there, too. Let's see. Adela. Oh, stop it with this. Stop right now. Look at that. We did not make that right now. Alex. I don't... Is that possible? Listen, I don't announce the dino of the day. and You heard it. Like, it was 40 minutes ago. So, yeah, people are crushing it. I'm, never, again, never not impressed. Look at these. Post-it note gallery on the wall for Agus. Notes. Right? I love them so much. Oh, my gosh. That's so cool. You have a wall? Wow. 
Wow. I just like can't. Right? It's so, so good. So good. These are amazing. Huxley, that's a good one. I like Huxley. Yes. And I like how everyone cap or so many people captured the like. <laughs> Kurt, they're like, I'm not doing Archaeopteryx. It's crows. We're doing crows today. Kurt is the crow. That's fine. Uh, Denise. Oh, look at this. Some different uh, flight iterations. That's great. Get that ready one's to be surprised. <laughs> Ooh, I like Richard. Oh, neat. Colors and Archie the Archaeopteryx. That is good. Let's see. Oh, look at Amy's with the wings and the arms out. Yes. That is great. That is beautiful. Pretty good. Also different. I love that. Another, wow. Oh, this is a die. I love this crow and Archaeopteryx and little feather breakdown. Feather evolution breakdown. Margot so comes. Not only were they draw, not that to suggest that other people weren't, but like the drawing and the listening is the part that amazes me because I would just be like drawing and totally tuning out. Yeah. yeah. Well, the the ability to multitask in this Zoom room is unprecedented. Look at this. Rivers, oh. hold that up. Oh, it looks great, Rivers. I like that we can see in its mouth a little bit. Yes. I yes. love the yellow. It really pops. Ooh, we got a couple right here. Another, Archie's a popular name for an Archaeopteryx. I like that a lot. I like that too. Those are so good. Actual size. Actual size with pigeon. I love it. Looking good. Oh, Natty. I got to show Natty because, again, she's the only other person to ever get 10 out of 10. This is Richie, the Archaeopteryx. And this Love is your, it. when we have a tournament of champions for Dino or not a Dino, you and Natty are <laughs> going to be number one seeds. <laughs> All right, you guys, we are running a little bit low on time. So before we go, uh, first, I want to remind you guys, uh, we do this literally every single day. If you want to throw us a couple bones, uh, I'm simply Dustin hyphen Growick on Venmo. That is always very much appreciated. Um, I love that we just went through a pretty awesome paleo art gallery because tomorrow we are going to talk specifically about paleo art. We have one of my favorite paleo artists. His name is Jimmy Cananzaro. He's going to kind of talk to us about not only the history of paleo art, but his process when he makes renderings much like not those crows and ravens like this. This is a piece of his art. We're talking about his process, talk about paleo art, talk about how the depiction of dinosaurs in pop culture for the last 100, 150 years has totally become like what we think of and picture dinos, even though a lot of paleo artists have been using very scant evidence and making guesses as to what these things may have looked like, how they may have moved, the environments they're in. So tomorrow, paleo art with Jimmy, Ken, and Zaro. I'm very excited about that. Uh, but for now, I want to definitely give a huge shout and thank you so much to Kaylee our new 10 out of 10 dino or not a dino champion. Thank you for joining us, Kaylee. Um, please, where'd she go? I lost her screen. There she is, she's still here. here. Um, follow her on all the platforms. It's at Corvid Research. I honestly, you're one of my favorite people on science Twitter and I'm nerding out hard that you're here with us today. Uh, but for now, I do not care if you are studying feathers or simply reaching deep, deep down in your bag of mass to find the perfect ax murderer mass so you can go out in the field and study crows appropriately. Never stop digging. I'll see you guys tomorrow for Paleo Art. Thanks once again to Kaylee. Peace out. Have a great Thursday, guys. Bye.